Thanks very much. It's a joy to be with you all. Um, and as you heard, I get to teach two things at Whitworth University, kind of traditional courses in New Testament and in Greek, but also courses in environmental studies. And it's largely an excuse to get outside with my students a lot. Um, and also to do my two favorite things in the world, which is to study God's revelation of God's self in the natural world, in creation, and God's revelation in scripture. Um, it's just the greatest delight. These pictures that you'll be seeing throughout my talk are um, depictions of Whitworth's Verbrugge Environmental Center. It's a site of about 900 acres, about a half hour north of our campus in a river valley in some of the hills up above this river valley. And several years ago, I wanted to put together a guidebook of this site um, so the students could identify the trees and some of the species that are there. I have no artistic talent whatsoever, so I hired a student, a recent graduate, to do the art. And ever since then, I can steal her art for my presentations, which is great. But one of the things that happened while I was working on this project was I realized what is, I guess, a pretty obvious point, which is how we can see the world in different ways. I would be so struck as I worked with this artist at how she would decide to portray something. So for example, the picture that's up right now is of a Rocky Mountain maple. And all that was required of Lauren was to draw a Rocky Mountain maple and make sure some of the identifying features were described below the text. But of course, inevitably, anytime you draw or paint something, you have to decide what to leave in, what to, what to put in, um, what to emphasize. So he or she, for example, has some ocean spray in the front there um, and some thimble berries, which if you ever come visit me in the Northwest in the summer, they're my favorite uh, red, really tasty, kind of moussey raspberries flavor berries. She's had to decide to look at the scene in a particular way. And for me, this scene is one of beauty and harmony, one that leads me to worship God, one that leads me to want to explore, to do science. But I could look at the scene in other ways too. I could focus, for example, entirely on the struggle for existence that underlies this apparently placid scene before us, um, the way in which evolutionary history has shaped the species that happen to be present here, to emphasize, perhaps, as is often overemphasized, but just the struggle of the, uh, of, of the, for existence that's taking place here, the survival of the fittest. If I took my next door neighbor with me to the site, he worked for some time as a logger. So I know he would be much more attentive to how many board feet of lumber is still left here, how many houses could be built perhaps with the wood um, harvested from the trees here. He loves to ride his ATVs and snowmobiles, so he'd be excited to think about using the site for that. If I took some of my environmentalist friends here, they might notice, first of all, that this is actually a clear cut where this Rocky Mountain maple is growing. Um, some of the snags in the background are some of the larch that the logging company left as seed trees, but which died out once the trees around them had been cut down. Um, and it might lead them to think about all of the invasive species that are here. Um, it might lead them to think more broadly about the Pacific Northwest and how we have lost the great majority of our ancient forests. In fact, just since I've moved to Spokane nine years ago, one large mammal has been extirpated from the lower 48. I have a good friend uh, who works with the Kalispell tribe of Indians in northwest, northeastern Washington state, um, and he focuses on studying caribou, um, reindeer. And just in the time since I've been there, when I first got to Spokane, I always thought when I was hiking in the mountains, one of these days I'm going to come around a corner and there's going to be a mountain caribou standing there. Um, those hopes are gone or at least deferred for a long time because they simply are absent now from the lower 48, mostly because of habitat loss, because of things like this, the lichen that they depend upon um, no longer available, the protection of the ancient forests no longer there, and a whole host of other factors that's, that's taken place. It's interesting to me how, for environmentalists, a kind of traditional Christian narrative of paradise and fall um, has a certain resonance and a certain strength. In any case, as you can see, the obvious point is there's lots of ways to look at the world, lots of ways to incorporate the inf different information we have about the world. And one of the things that I think Christian faith does for us is it gives us a vision of the world before us, one that actually helps us to see it as it is, that gives us a particular orientation towards the world and calls us to certain practices. It doesn't answer all our questions, as Dr. Walton has been pointing out for us um, today, uh, but it does answer some questions. It tells us how to look at the world before us. I've always loved the definition of Christian conversion that Evelyn Waugh gives us, who's a um, British novelist of the early 20th century. And Waugh said, conversion is stepping across the threshold into the real world that God made and then begins the delicious process of exploring it limitlessly. <laughs>
And I like that picture of what conversion is. Among other things, it's, it's helping us to see the world aright and then to explore it. So one of the things I'm going to do today is to try in very, very brief uh, a time that we have together to give you a picture of a biblical vision of the world and how some of our contemporary scientific understanding of the world fits within that and how in fact the biblical vision might in fact call us to respond to that in a particular way. Uh, when Kim Lynn was sending emails to the speakers about what Dr. Bender, about what was expected uh, of our talks, he kind of had this delightful invitation. He said, pretend you have a room full of seminarians and pastors and others who are interested in Christian faith, what is the most important thing for you to tell them about how Christianity and science go together? So that was a wonderful way to express it. And what you're going to hear in this uh, hour is the thing that I think is absolutely most critical for Christians in our time. And that is to be faithful in how we care for the earth. I think there is no moral challenge of our century that is more compelling, that is more necessary for us to address than that. I may not convince you of that in the one hour we have together, but I hope at least to help you begin to understand why I think that and perhaps to plant some seeds uh, for further research and exploration on your own of why that might be the case. One of the things I've been so grateful for Dr. Walton's work for is the way that he has helped to dispel the myth of this war between science and faith. And one of the reasons I think that is so important is because it has distracted us, this war, this artificial war, from actually attending to the world as God's creation. Most prominent environmentalists, many scientists, see Christians as people who are very quick to defend our belief that God made the world, but who fail utterly to live like it. And so one of the things by recognizing that science and faith need not be in conflict perhaps can help us to turn again to actually be attentive to the goodness and beauty of the world that God has created and to ask ourselves what it might look like to live as faithful Christians in this time and place. Because one of the arguments of my talk in the second section is going to be that we actually live in a unique time. Now, everyone who's ever said that has been wrong. And so I'm standing here, you know, likely to be wrong, given the fact that everyone always is when they say that. It's just an inattentiveness to history to think that your time is so unique or distinct. But I actually think we do live in a unique time for reasons that I will explain. Human beings have always caused potentially environmental degradation, have suffered the results, um, but never before at the scale, at the cosmic scale that we are facing in our own time. And so I think there are some things that are unique and distinctive about our time. And one of the reasons why I think this issue is the issue of our century for Christianity to address. The other reason, though, I think that this is absolutely central is because it's central to the gospel, to the biblical vision of the world that's held out to us. And that's part of the argument of this talk, of course, that I'll try to touch on a few reasons I think that. Both at the beginning, and suggesting a biblical vision of the world, and actually a biblical vision of the world in which what science tells us about the loss of species, about the degradation of ecosystems, about climate change, actually makes sense with what Scripture tells us about ourselves and our relationship to the world. But also the vision that Scripture gives us of hope, of how we respond to a situation like the one that we are facing. Um, and how Christians can have a distinctive voice in this. We should not be people who are known for opposing good care for God's earth, but those who are at the forefront, and actually articulating a distinctively Christian way of doing that, a way that won't simply map on to all the other ways. I think one of the reasons that we have been distracted from it is that we, especially in our own context here in North America, have seen the issues we'll talk about here as party political issues. They've gotten caught up in the cultural wars that divide us. And that's why I'm going to spend just a little bit of time doing, it's not really sociology because I'm not a sociologist, but just a glance at the different ways in which people in our society respond to the science that I'll present in the second section of my talk. To ask the question, what does an appropriate Christian response look like uh, to what the science is telling us about the nature of our world? That should not be driven by our politics. That should not be driven by other cultural things. It should be driven by the gospel. And so I'm going to try to argue for at least some ideas of how that might look. So that's where we're, where we're headed. And we're going to start with this biblical vision. And I'm going to start with what is perhaps the most important thing, which is the goodness of this creation. Seven times, as, we, as we've already heard, this world in all of its orderness is said by God to be good, to be fit for purpose for what God created it to be. And notice six of those times is before human beings are even described here in Genesis 1. Six of these times before human beings turn up. Creation is good. This is actually something distinctive to Christianity. I teach a course on environmental ethics, 
And my students struggle and fail to come up with any reason why we should value other life other than its utilitarian benefit for us. On that point, as well as on the distinctive value of human life, Christians actually have something to say. Other life has value before God. We can call it intrinsic value, to use the term that ethicists use, although that's misleading because in Christian framework, nothing is intrinsic, nothing stands alone. Other life is, has value because it is created by God, it is named by him as good, and it is included in God's purposes for the whole of creation, as we will see. Um, other life has value before God. Um, God names it good. I'm trying to decide whether to try to read this backwards or look at the screen, so I apologize. <laughs> um, I wanted to just point out really briefly, one of the challenges we face sometimes is that we always go just to Genesis when we're trying to develop a biblical theology of creation. But of course, Scripture has a tremendous amount to say about the created world that is not in Genesis. In fact, a lot more to say about it. I was tempted to cancel this whole session. Someone earlier suggested we should have it outside. To just cancel this session, give you all Psalm 104, and go sit outside somewhere and read Psalm 104 and be attentive to the world around us. That may actually do more work in our lives than any amount of me talking at you. Um, Because Psalm 104 is this beautiful psalm um, that celebrates the wonder and diversity of God's creation. Um, and every part of creation is celebrated here. Notice, by the way, this talks about the cedars of Lebanon. And of course, we know the cedars of Lebanon are useful for building the temple, right? In other texts in the Hebrew Bible. And yet here, they also are just a place that provides a home for birds. They're habitat for other life. Settled human beings find their life in this psalm amidst the rhythms of the rest of creation. Um, but so do all other creatures, even those that are terrifying to us. Even, for example, the lions that are roaring for their prey. All these things are a part of God's good earth um, and testify to God's uh, glory and goodness. So a creation that is good in all of its diversity, and it's a creation that exists not for us, but for God's glory. Often Christians are said to have a thoroughly anthropocentric view of the world, but we ought not to if we do. Scripture is thoroughly theocentric. It's focused on God and God's revelation in Christ, and that is true too in what Scripture says about creation. The world, the created world, belongs not to us, but it belongs to God. Um, it be- it's created for God, it's f- created for Christ, created to bring God pleasure for the glory of God. For God, not for us. It's also a creation that since it is created by God and ordered by God, that reveals something of who God is. So perhaps most famously, you, we may uh, turn to Psalm 19 and Romans 1, that say creation reveals something about God something that is potentially accessible to every single person. It's not restricted just to those, um, uh, the Israelites. It's something that all can observe. And this is a theme in the New Testament as all as well. This is a text that is gone to less often, I think, and talks about natural theology. But in Acts 14, Paul is preaching to people in Lystra who have no knowledge of the God of the Hebrew Bible. And the people actually are wanting to worship uh, Paul and Barnabas. And so they rush out into the crowd, pulling off their clothes, basically to say, look, we're just human beings like all of you, what they say, but we are here to proclaim the living God. But you know what Paul says? This isn't the first you've heard of this God. Now, from the context of the story, they know nothing about the God of the Hebrew Bible, but what, how is God born witness to God's self? It is through creation. It is through the rains in its season from the food that, they, that supplies their need, even from the experience of joy that they have in their hearts. Paul says all of these things are witnesses, are testimonies to the one God, the God that now is being proclaimed in God's fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. So Paul assumes that they know something about God. If this is right, it makes me think that when we destroy God's creation, we are doing something analogous to ripping pages out of our Bible before passing it along to others. We are diminishing the way in which creation testifies to the glory of the one God. So, a creation that reveals God. We also belong to a community of creation in which I've used, I'm using the uh, words of Aldo Leopold here, in which we are plain members and citizens. Where do we fit in? And I want to emphasize, actually, as Dr. Walton already has begun to do for us, our insignificance in Scripture. I actually think evolutionary biology helped recall our society to a more biblical understanding of humanity's place in creation after the enlightenment that put us at the center of everything. Because scripture actually says that we belong to other creatures. For one thing, we are Adam from the Adama, although I may have to revise this slide now in light of Dr. Walton's presentation earlier. But regardless of how we 
uh, think of the relationship between those two phrases, we are dusty creatures, right? That's said over and over again. Um, we are dust of the earth and to the dust we return. Human from the humus, we might say. Um, now you might think, well, but we became a living being. And if you're looking at the King James Version, it'll say that we became a living soul. Well, that's what gives us our distinctiveness. We have souls other creatures don't. But that nefesh chaya is not something that belongs just to us. Notice here that everything that has the breath of life in it, that is a living soul, it's the same expression there. Other creatures are described in that same way. So I think we'll perhaps be hearing more about this tomorrow from Dr. Murphy. But whatever the text means here about this, um, it does not distinguish us from other creatures. And that's true right at the end of Scripture, by the way. Revelation describes the death of sea creatures in the sea and says all those that have souls. So other creatures... um, all share in the same breath of life that God gives us. We are told to increase on the earth and to fill it, but notice too, other creatures are as well. In fact, we're told that other creatures are told to. um, All the birds and the fish in Genesis 1 and all the other land animals as well um, there in uh, Genesis uh, 7, or sorry, Genesis 8. Um, Other land animals, those that we are created alongside uh, on the same day, all given this blessing of fruitfulness, um, We are often reminded of the fact that we are uh, mortal, that our life is temporary and seems so insignificant in the scheme of things. And I have purposely quoted two New Testament passages, uh, one of which is quoted in the Old Testament to remind us of that. Um, Flowers of the field, grass withers and the flowers fall. A mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So on on the one hand, Scripture seems to say that we are incredibly insignificant, Um, We don't matter at all. Um, Back to Psalm 103, again, the same thing that was quoted there, the life of mortals is like grass, here today and gone tomorrow. But of course, that's not the whole story because the rest of the psalm on either side of this reminds us that our distinctive identity and value come not from anything that's intrinsic to us. We're one land animal among others. We're earthy creatures. We are here today and gone tomorrow, our place remembered no more. But we are creatures with whom God has entered into a particular relationship. A God who has compassion on us, as a parent has compassion on their children. A God who loves us. And it is God's love for us and God's decision to enter into that particular relationship with us that gives us our distinctive role and our, our distinctive value. So the psalmist who you picture being out on a rock looking up at a night sky, wondering how human beings can possibly matter in the vast expanse of things. You know, and sometimes we think it's just in our own time where we have a sense of the vastness of the universe that we are able to grasp how little we might matter. But I actually think that our imaginations are limited enough that there's no way in which that question is any more pressing for us now than it would be for a Middle Eastern shepherd sitting out on a hillside looking out at more stars than we can ever imagine, um, wondering what significance his life can possibly have. But of course the answer is, is that significance of human life is given to us by God. And so reflecting on the story of Genesis 1, um, this affirmation that we are given this particular role in creation to rule other creatures um, under the rule of God. Notice, by the way, in Psalm 8, it's bookended by God's rule. Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God is the king. God continues to rule from God's throne. But we are called to enter into uh, uh, the rule of creation as those who bear his image. So, we are not only then a member of the community of creation, which we are that, but we have a particular role within that community. We're called to rule and to care. So, created in the image of God, uh, so that we might rule. And Genesis 2, put it in the garden to work it and to keep it, to serve and protect. Um, This is priestly language, language that's used for the priests in the temple. Our relationship to the ground, to the garden, uh, to the earth is a relationship of care, of service, and protection. Just as God serves and protects us, um, the God who looks upon us um, and keeps us. I think we have an example of this in the story of Noah. Um, Noah is told three times here, what is Noah's role? It's to preserve life, to keep alive all of the creatures. I'm struck by this because if you think about it, this is a story of God who is able to send this vast, unimaginable flood upon the earth. God could clearly save all the creatures in any way that God chose. But how does God choose to do that? He doesn't call Noah to participate in the judgment that God is bringing upon the world. He calls Noah to participate in the saving of life. 
This is the role of humanity, is to save life, is to keep alive, the role that is given uh, from the beginning. So in the life of Israel, Israel called out from creation and established on the land as a sign of humanity's place on the earth in relationship with God. The land is caught up in the life of Israel. So Israel's faithfulness or not to God will be reflected in the state of the land itself. And even Israel's law, if we had time, we could look at examples in Israel's law of how jubilee regulations, the Sabbath years, ensure the protection of the land itself. Harvest is meant to be sustainable. Um, The life of the land is woven into the life of Israel. So creation's fate is linked to ours. And as we will see, Creation, therefore, in the context of human sin and unfaithfulness, is a creation that indeed groans. That is sadly the story, of course, of Scripture. It is not of us living as the true image bearers of God. Jesus, who shows us what it is to bear God's image. And what does Jesus do? Jesus goes to death on a cross on behalf of those whom Jesus rules. Um, That passage in Hebrew is actually quoting Psalm 8. That is not how our rule in creation has looked. We have sought to become gods unto ourselves, um, to reject the only one who can give us life and being, and therefore to experience exile. Exile from the life held out to us in the garden, exile from God, brokenness with God, brokenness in our relationships with each other, and our relationship with the earth too. Notice how this this curse of lack of fruitfulness is actually repeated right in the next story in Genesis, the story of Cain and Abel. There's actually a hint here of a contingency in the curse, of the curse, in fact. That's why it has to be pronounced again. This isn't something that one just accepts and says there's this brokenness in my relationship with creation, but rather that's going to look differently depending how people live out their relationship with God. There's an allusion to that in Job, in fact, as well, where Job says, if I had treated my workers unjustly, then the land would produce thorns and thistles for me. That's what one expects in the natural order of things. Uh, But in faithfulness for God, the basic expectation is that, therefore, our relationship with the land should reflect that as well. That's why, in fact, Noah, that preserver of life, is said to lift the conditions of the curse from the ground, one who gives us relief from the sweat of our brow. This brokenness between humanity and non-human creation is taken up in the life of Israel, and it's made cosmic. The land itself suffers. The earth itself mourns. It groans under the weight of human sin. Other creatures, even fish in the sea, and it's kind of, in Hosea's context, it's hard to understand how fish would suffer from Israel's sin. And yet, Hosea perceives this fundamental brokenness between humanity and creation uh, that is played out in the life of Israel on the land when Israel rejects God and God's purposes for them. All of this should make it not perhaps surprising to find in our own time that the earth responds to human activity on it. That God's faithfulness to creation and to us doesn't mean that we don't suffer the results of our unfaithful ways of living in creation and relationship with God. And so Paul picks up this theme in the New Testament um, in Romans 8. We're going to look at this for the hope that it gives us later on in my talk. But right now I just want us to notice what Paul says here about creation's subjection to frustration. Who is it that's subjecting creation? Well, the only one who could possibly have the power to do so would be God. God has subjected creation to futility. And interpreters often think that this just refers to the curse. God saying, cursed is the ground in relationship to you, uh, to Adam in the garden. But I don't understand how God could do that in hope. There's no sense in Genesis that God is cursing the ground in hope. I think rather what Paul is suggesting here is that God has subjected creation to human rule, to his image bearers within creation. And when God's human image bearers become empty and futile, Creation itself finds itself subject to futility, to emptiness. It cannot reach the end, the telos that God intends for it. Paul, in fact, uses the same word for, or a form of the same Greek word, metiates, for the futility here in Romans 1 when he talks about people not worshiping God but worshiping created things. We become empty in our thinking, futile in our thinking. And so I think Paul is setting us up to see here that creation's subjecting, subjection to futility is a subjection to human creatures that do not reflect God's image. All of creation still glorifies God, praises God in the Psalms. But creation is not complete until that final member of the cosmic choir joins in with the rest of creation and takes up our appropriate role within God's earth. Without that, it is broken, subject to futility, and longing for the future that God has promised. 
This, I think, is a passage that sends us to the second part of my talk to think about in what ways do we discern, do we see creation's groaning in our own time? And so this returns me to my, let's skip that slide for now, to my claim at the beginning that there is something unique about our time. And lots of prominent scientists are saying that same thing. Uh, Sir Martin Rees, who is the president of the Royal Society in Great Britain, the foremost scientific body there, um, wrote this book, Our Final Hour. Um, it was actually entitled Our uh, Final Century when it was published in the UK, but the publishers thought Americans wouldn't care if we had a whole year, our whole century left, and so he had to say Our Final Hour, then maybe people would buy the book and be like, oh no, we really do have to wake up. But he, among others, say that there's something unique about our time. In fact, scientists are beginning to call it the Anthropocene. Not because human beings have never had an impact on the earth before, but because never on the scale that we're experiencing now. And so let me unpack some of the reasons for that. The first one is simply human population. And I think it's absolutely critical that whenever we talk about population, we begin by saying that the biblical view of the image of God tells us that every single human being, without exception, is deserving of dignity, is valued by God, is loved by God, and calls for our love, and is to be celebrated and cherished. Um, that's unmistakably clear. It's one of the distinctives of a Christian vision of creation and of humanity. Um, it's not based on our capacities or our abilities. It is based on God's love for us and creation of us in God's image. But nonetheless, we just have to be attentive to the reality of what it means for nearing 8 billion people who all need food, who all need shelter, and who all deserve lives of flourishing, lives of dignity, um, and the impact that that has on the earth. In the time of Jesus, there was maybe 250 million people throughout the planet. A thousand years later, we were up to maybe just 300 million. Didn't reach the first billion till the 19th century, to about 1800. Um, and as you can see, the graph was for a time more than exponential increase, such that we are now near 8 billion Expected, no one, anyone who says they can predict demography um, is not to really be trusted, but to the extent that they can attempt to, perhaps around 10 billion people by the middle of the century. Again, all people who deserve to have flourishing lives. Um, that simply has an impact on the earth. Um, and some of the ways, just to, these numbers I, tend, I know tend to just wash over us, but it's worth just thinking for a minute about the impact that we have in life on earth. Um, Scientists estimate that 85% of the ice-free land is directly influenced by human beings. And of course, if we say indirect influence, we would say that's even higher. If we think about microplastics found uh, even in the most remote regions of the planet. Um, we collectively move more earth and rock than all of the erosion taking place all over the globe. Um, all of the rivers and rains and um, glaciers moving, human beings move more of that. Human agriculture, our need to grow food for ourselves, means that we have replaced much of the Earth's um, habitats for other life. Um, so here in this place of beautiful prairie and grassland, and I actually found a picture um, that was free to use online, since I've never been to Texas before, um, of a native prairie here in Texas. Um, and I've just been hearing actually today about exciting efforts um, to reclaim pocket um, places of revitalized ground where native grasses are being planted again and the diversity of life is coming back. Um, but when we think about the global picture, we have lost so much of the places for other life uh, to live and to thrive. Um, our impact on the earth means that just to grow plants for ourselves, we are responsible for a third of the productivity of all of the earth's plants. We are the biggest impact that the earth has seen in a couple billion years on the nitrogen cycle. And this is a result of something that, on the one hand, we ought to celebrate. Nitrogen makes up something like 80% of the air, but it's unavailable to plants unless it gets fixed, usually by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. It's usually the limiting nutrient for plants as long as they have enough water. Our ability to fix nitrogen from the air and to make fertilizer, as this fertilizer plant that I have in the picture here is doing, has enabled us to grow enough food to feed the world, to feed that 7.8 billion people. Now you're going to say, but lots of people have starved, and lots of people are starving. But that's, of course, because of injustice and inequity and inequality, that food has not been distributed um, equally among, amongst the earth. But up till now, at least, we have been able to grow enough food because of the gift of nitrogen fertilizer and phosphorus and so forth. Um, yet, it's worth just confronting the scale 
of our impact. And also the fact that this gift of technology and of science can also be abused. And so at the same time as we celebrate that, we also recognize that our misuse of fertilizer, our weddedness to industrial ways of farming that often are not attentive to the needs of the place in which we are doing our farming, um, our rush for efficiency and for a lack of care for the future has meant that much of the earth's uh, land for growing food is degraded and is being degraded. Topsoil it takes perhaps a thousand years to grow an inch of topsoil, and yet it's being lost at orders of magnitude faster than it can be replenished. If you ever, like I do, go to conferences on such things, I almost tend to avoid soil scientists because so often they have this sort of look of panic in their eyes and kind of buttonhole you in a corner to talk to you about this unnoticed loss of the great connector of life that is the world's soils. If we look at habitat, other habitats, I think about forests. And these numbers are trickier for reasons I won't go into right now uh, because of our time. Um, but though these precise numbers, it depends a bit on how you count a forest, for example, that's been converted from natural forest cut down and then is going to be regrown as a plantation forest. So these numbers are difficult. But the reality is, however you parse the numbers, we continue to lose forests, and particularly in the tropics, where we have the greatest reserves of biodiversity on Earth, um, at a rate that is not replenished. And we are losing ancient forests that protect so much more diversity than those second growth forests and plantation forests. So the estimate is probably perhaps about 12 million acres of that tropical forest we continue to use year on year. Um, got a lot of attention this last year because of the fires in Brazil. Ironically, this wasn't a particularly, from what I have read so far, not a particularly bad year, actually. And the press was misrepresenting graphs comparing it just five years ago when actually it was, um, on the whole, not as bad as it has been in the past. Um, but that's an example of the fact that we need to sometimes be more attentive to these scenes from day to day and not just wait for the media to call our attention to it. Um, these are things that are happening without our notice too often because we are insulated from them in our places of privilege um, in the country where we live. The ocean's uh, fisheries are being fully exploited or overexploited, such that when I say fully exploited, that means that in any increase in harvest or other threat to that fishery is likely to send it into decline, uh, perhaps terminal decline. That continues to be a challenge. Of course, there are ways to address this if you do eat seafood, about thinking about which fish that we do eat. But again, our impact on these limitless, apparently, you know, if you just see the ocean um, that seem limitless, our impact on it um, is nonetheless um, astonishing. And of course, oceans absorb much of the carbon dioxide um, that we have emitted, which has helped um, make global warming slower than it otherwise would be, of course. But it also makes the oceans acidic and makes the oceans warmer. And that's leading to a loss of coral reefs, which are at the bottom, the basis of the ocean food chain. Most uh, significant to me is how all of this contributes simply to the loss of other life. Genesis gives us dominion over other creatures. That's our place, is to rule over other creatures, to care for them. Um, and yet under our watch, other creatures are being lost at terrible rates, both just in the diversity of other kinds of life, but also in sheer numbers. This is perhaps, this is, I hope you'll, you maybe can't see where you're seeing Everything that I cite in this slide is from peer-reviewed scientific literature. So I'm not going to newspaper articles or secondary things that are often misleading. It's all peer-reviewed literature. This is the one figure that is inevitably and um, necessarily less secure. We can't know exactly what it is. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to do a meta-study of how much life is being lost. But no one disputes the basic picture. And when I saw this, I was floored to think that practically just within my lifetime, um, we have found ourselves in a position where there is 60% fewer wild vertebrate life than there was. Um, that's an astonishing thing to happen in such a short amount of time and ought to give us pause. As I said, we are insulated from this. We don't attend to it in our daily life. We can't, we are distracted from it. And yet I think as Christians, if one of our roles is to care for other creatures, this ought to be something that is at the forefront. Now you notice... Um, on this graph, that when we try to attempt to account for what's causing this, it's fairly traditional things, the sorts of things I studied as a wildlife biologist. It's loss of habitat and it's over-exploitation. Climate change makes an appearance here, but only as a small contributor. 
And I've purposely waited to talk about climate change because even if the climate wasn't changing, we are facing a crisis in the Earth's ecosystems um, that we are called to address. Um, and I wouldn't want that to get lost in our focus only on climate change. Nonetheless, I am going to talk about climate change because it is the force that will, in a sense, overwhelm and affect all of these other things that, that I've talked about. Um, and I'll talk about why that's the case in a minute here. So it's a small contributor right now to this, but is going to grow over the next century. I'm going to skip that for now and go here. Now, talking about climate change, I think is just instinctively difficult for those of us that live in places like we do, where we are insulated from the negative effects of it, and I'll talk about that a bit more later on, um, by air conditioning and heating and uh, rich societies that uh, make life not difficult for us. Perhaps we're a farmer, we notice things are changing. Um, and then we have things like this, where even where I live in Spokane, it's unusual for us to get snow in uh, September and early October. But this last September, we had a few inches of snow, enough for my friend Landon to be skiing um, in the mountain above town, um, and my backyard covered in snow in early October already. And in fact, October was the coldest month on record in Spokane. I loved it in a way. It was fun to be getting snow already up in the mountains. And so it's easy to say, well, what is all this about climate change? Um, and of course, if you look at this map, you'll notice that actually there's that big blue spot right over the northwest of the United States. Indeed, it was very cold. But the global picture is quite different. Um, even in a globe that is warming, of course, we are going to have colder times and months and seasons in some parts of the globe. In fact, October was the second warmest October recorded. And the last time we had even a single month that was below the long-term average was in 1984. So we've not had a single month globally even that's been below the long-term average since 1984. Um, this is a picture just of the last five years looking at the warming of the globe. And if you take the last five years that have been the warmest recorded, you can see that they are on this trajectory that has been relentlessly upward. Um, we live in a time of a rather rapidly, and in fact the rate is one of the things that is most concerning as we'll talk about, a rapidly warming climate. Um, and that it correlates with the things we might expect. So for example, here you see in the upper right the rise in sea levels, which is a cause which is caused both by thermal expansion, warmer water expands. That's been the main driver until recently. Now the main driver of the rise in sea levels is actually the melting of, uh, of ice, um, of land ice that uh, raises the sea levels. You have the loss of Arctic ice shown there in the bottom right. That's the most recent um, graph that I could find from this last month. You have the acidity of the oceans increasing, as you see uh, in the graph in the bottom left. Um, and you also notice that the graph in the bottom left shows this inexorable rise in the levels of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. And so that leads us to talk for just a really brief minute um, about the science of climate change, of global warming. Um, and I just want to note very briefly, without going into it, this is not something new. So nearly 200 years ago, it was recognized that there had to be something that was keeping the Earth warmer than it otherwise would be. Um, and that something uh, is discovered to be uh, the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide and other things that make up our atmosphere. Without that, the, the sun's radiation would simply bounce back out to space and we would be a floating ball of ice. And so we should be glad, actually, for the greenhouse effect, um, so-called, because these gases trap the outgoing infrared heat energy of the sun and re-emit it in all directions, um, including out to space, but some of that back to Earth, and helps moderate the Earth's climate keeps us much warmer than we otherwise would be. Um, so because of the physics simply of these molecules, of these carbon molecules, the Earth is warmer than it otherwise would be. So the greenhouse effect, again, is a really good thing. The question is what happens when you start to increase the concentration of those gases in the atmosphere, those gases that trap that energy and reflect it back to the Earth. And as early as 1896, Arrhenius, actually kind of a back of a napkin sort of a calculation, just sort of hypothetically, I said, well, what would happen if we doubled the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And his estimate is not terribly far off from what the most sophisticated computer models come up with today. His based simply on the basic physics. There's lots of other factors that affect the climate, of course, uh, but even he came up with a figure not too far away. I also just want to note, I feel like it's important to note, that already by 1968, the American Petroleum Institute commissioned a study that recognized that we were already on course to lead to dramatic impacts on the Earth 
as a result of burning fossil fuels. And at this stage, there was different ways these companies could have responded, we as a society could have responded. One is to begin to pursue other means of energy, to consider how we might shift our dependence upon fossil fuels. The other is the path that was taken, which was to raise questions to sow doubt so that no action would be taken and nothing would interfere with business as usual. And that narrative continues right uh, to our present time. And it's sobering because if you consider how, many of the, how much of the greenhouse gases that have been emitted have been emitted just in the last couple of decades, if we had taken action much earlier, perhaps the nature of the action we would have needed to take would have been less, much more modest than it is likely to be now. You can see we now stand at about 408 um, parts per million um, higher than uh, the carbon dioxide concentration has been, certainly in the history of humanity and uh, perhaps the last million years. Now, because of, um, when, when scientists put all of the factors that in, impact the climate together and try to model what has actually happened, um, they actually, they get something that fits pretty well, as you can see here in the graph on your left. If you take out the human contribution human contribution to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it simply doesn't work. It can't model what we're actually experiencing. And that's the reason that the IPCC and other scientists can have such high confidence in the fact that it is actually the human factor that's leading to the increase in global temperature. And in fact, it dwarfs the other things that we know are also going on. Um, well, what's different? I've already alluded to the fact that the climate has changed dramatically throughout the Earth's history. This graph is actually just during the time of human flourishing of human civilization, the Holocene. Um, if we push this graph back, we'd see the temperature has varied dramatically over time. So the Earth can be much hotter and much colder than it is right now. What's different about climate change right now? Well, the first, of course, is just the cause. And that's not so much a scientific difference as it is just an a difference that might lead us to question ethics and values. Does it matter that we're the ones driving this change in the climate with the knock-on effects and so many other things? The rate is unprecedented um, in the course of human history. And you can actually see that through the whole Holocene, the Earth has stayed within about one degree Celsius. Um, and we now are exceeding that. So we now have actually, if you take just the last five years, we're about one degree Celsius um, above the long-term average. And that doesn't sound like much, again, for those of us that experience a beautiful sunny day now, perhaps in a few days it's going to be quite a lot colder when a cold front comes through for Wednesday. And it seems like, well, what possible difference can one degree Celsius make? But of course, we're talking about the global average. And if you think about an ice age, for example, the difference between an ice age and an interglacial period, an ice period like we're having now, is only about 4 degrees Celsius. And so small differences in this have huge impacts on the globe. And of course, during an ice age, much of the Earth is covered in ice. The sea levels are 350 feet lower than they are right now. Um, so these modest differences in the Earth's uh, global temperature have a profound impact on other things. And that, of course, is the third reason, and the reason why we need to talk about climate change just because of its effects. Um, particularly in a globe that is already fragmented and already under threat for the reasons that I outlined earlier, climate change makes it particularly difficult for ecosystems, for other life, and for human life to adapt. Um, we talk about sea level rise. We can talk about fresh water as the glaciers, particularly in the Himalaya, um, disappear, um, that so many people depend upon for their fresh water. We can talk about extreme weather events, um, this is actually one of the greatest challenges is that extreme weather events pose to farming, to agriculture. With a very modest rise in greenhouse gases, we might actually be able to grow more food, basically at the point that we are right now, because of course carbon dioxide is a fertilizer, helps plants to grow. But we already are at the point where we are raising the Earth's temperature to a point that even with fairly radical adaptation, we are threatening our ability to go on growing enough food for the world. Um, and that is due in part, not simply to the warming of the globe, the fact that some places have become impossible to grow food or the food that's been grown there before. Because of extreme weather events, you see a warmer climate is a climate that has more water vapor, that has more extreme weather events. So you have stronger precipitation events and longer lasting droughts, and sometimes those happen in the same place over the course of just a couple of years. And it's those in particular that make it so difficult for human society and human agriculture to adapt to the challenges that climate change is sending to us. And what does that mean? It means some people's homelands become uninhabitable. I talk about this a lot to my students. I give presentations on this. It can all seem very hypothetical about the future. And then I talk to someone who's just returned from the majority world. 
And I hear stories of people who are already facing the effects of climate change in their homelands, where rainfall patterns have changed dramatically. A friend who's just returned from Paraguay, from the Peace Corps there, um, who are already living at the margins and who can no longer survive. It's those people that lead me to keep giving talks like this, to be honest. People who are already facing the threats. And what is our temptation to do? It's to close our borders to people fleeing things. Because refugees are always, of course, impacted not just by one thing. It's not just climate. There's also underlying inequality, inequities, injustice, oppressive governments, all these things taking place that are a nature of our broken world. But climate change exacerbates all of that. And it's why even as our government ignores it, our Pentagon prepares for climate change wars in the future because it knows it's part of the threat matrix. It's part of what changes life in our world. So it is those stories and those people from the majority world that we need to just simply start to listen to perhaps and to stop thinking that we are going to lead but we're going to learn from them about their experience now and how we can come alongside them. All right. I actually should have not gone there yet because one of my whole points in all of this was with Catherine Hayhoe, um, who teaches at Texas Tech. Some of you perhaps know her um, and who is one of the world's leading climate scientists and an evangelical Christian. Um, whenever she gives a talk, she always says the science ends here. And I jumped ahead of myself because I jumped past the science just now, so I should have had this slide earlier, I guess. But I want to emphasize that one of the reasons, as I suggested earlier, environmental issues so-called and climate change is so controversial is that we immediately import into it, just as we have done with evolutionary biology and many evolutionary biologists have done, ideologies. Ideologies that we associate in our own country with the progressive left um, and with the Democratic Party. But these are not party issues. Um, these are issues that call for a response. They do require politics. They require ethics. They require questions of value and worldview. And it is that place where Christians are poised to have a distinctive voice and a distinctive vision of the world that suggests how we respond to these things. Um, at the moment, as we consider our response, I think this is the response of most of us, and I include myself here. I don't play golf, but if you just put a fly rod into their hands, that could well be me down there fly fishing, not paying attention while this is happening all around me because we are not attentive to the world around us and we are insulated from its effects. We are distracted by our technology. The same technology that gives us the ability to study these scenes, to understand what's happening, also enables us to live in virtual worlds that keep us isolated from each other and from the, and from the world that we are called to inhabit and be attentive to and to care for. So that's one response, and it's often enabled by a response that says any problems we face we'll be able to solve with technology. We've gotten ourselves out of things before, we'll be able to do so in the future. Now, there's a reasoned way of articulating that, of course, but unfortunately, too often, it is a way of simply ignoring action, postponing action, while people suffer right now and where we continue to experience this diminishment of life. So-called self-styled eco-modernists give a philosophical underpinning to this, suggesting that we don't actually belong to the community of creation. We have transcended it, in a sense. The limits that pertain to the natural world do not apply to human beings because through the pursuit of technology, we can lift ourselves out from this world and not need be constrained by it. Um, now, there's a lot more discussion to be had there, um, but that's one response is to simply say, we're not actually constrained by this. We should just pursue all the more modernity, technology, even the things that have gotten us into this mess because eventually we will find our way out of it. On the other side, we have an increasing proliferation of books that emphasize the challenges that we face, um, that lament, perhaps, what has been lost. I think about Bill McKibben's first book, The End of Nature, uh, the first one to kind of bring climate change to the popular consciousness, lamenting what McKibben thought had been lost. Now, these books often exaggerate um, the science, but they primarily just present the science in a worst-case scenario, you might say. Um, so for some reason, this book, The Uninhabitable Earth, has gotten a lot of traction recently, um, just putting together some of the things that we've already been hearing, perhaps giving it a bit of a um, dramatic spin. Um, but nonetheless, this is one response, is lament. Um, but that can also spur action, of course. And so it's amazing how Greta Thunberg um, becomes this uh, most unlikely um, leader of a, a global movement. Um, and we have groups like the Extinction Rebellion in the UK. So that's another response, right, is activism. Many activists, many climate scientists who I know, people who are most engaged in these things, even, even many biologists who are intimate with particular ecosystems and systems and wildlife that they study and that they come to love, are prone to despair, 
Um, and this perhaps is something that you're going to encounter if you are pastors, if you are teachers, with school children, with students. I find it with some of my students, and I find it especially with those who are scientists. Um, a sense that it's too late, perhaps. That no one notices these things that are going on, and we're not doing anything about them. Um, that despair can even lead to movements like the Dark Mountain Project, which suggests it's too late to change anything, and so let's move beyond despair and embrace the different future that's going to come after civil civilization collapses. That sounds like fantastical sorts of things right now, um, but it's a sort of thing that attention to these issues has led some people to, and it's a place where Christians are especially, again, poised to speak a different message and a message of hope, and that's where I'm going to end my talk today, is talking about the distinctive vision of Christian hope and what that might mean for how we live in the world today. And Christian hope, of course, is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ and the incarnation, that the God of the universe should bind himself to this fleshly existence. In Jesus Christ, join this bloody, sweaty, dirty life on this world. And I shouldn't tread where Dr. Walton is not willing to tread, but I will say Jesus shares the genetics of a human being, right? He shares gut bacteria. If he's a functioning human being, if the incarnation is true, then God of the universe is composed of lots of genetic material of gut bacteria in the person of Jesus Christ because that's what it is to be a human being. Jesus is a part of this world. God binds God's self to this world in Christ and therefore shows us that this creation, this created world, is a fitting vehicle for the revelation of the divine, for the revelation of God's self. Um, in that incarnation, God binds God's self to the whole of creation and, of course, shows us that God's intention is for the reconciliation of all things. Every single thing uh, reconciled to God in Christ, made at peace, so that we have a new heavens and a new earth to look forward to that isn't the giving up of this world, isn't a making all new things, rubbishing what is here, that which God called good, that which God cares for, that which praises God, that which God calls us to care for. God doesn't just give up on it. God redeems it and renews it in the new creation to come. And we return then to Romans 8, which is where I think this is the most uh, unmistakably clear of anywhere else in Scripture. The same world that now groans has a future in God's new creation. It shares in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. At the resurrection, this creation too finds its liberation. It finds its freedom from its futility to ruin and to, and to despair that it has now. And we might say, well, that's all in the future and it's all what God does. But notice that in Romans 8, what is creation waiting for? It's waiting for the revealing of God's children. Well, when do we become God's children? Paul has just told us earlier in the same passage that anyone who is in Christ, anyone who is led by the Spirit of God, is an adopted child of God. God's Spirit bearing witness to our identity as God's children. And so I think the implication of this passage is that if God's children begin to live as who we actually are created to be in Christ— Creation ought to begin to experience signs of its hope for liberation. It should no longer be subject to ruin and to futility when God's people live as God's people are called to live. We can be, as Paul says elsewhere, instantiations of that new creation in Christ that breaks in right here. We are bulwarks of that new creation that God is establishing in Christ and are meant to be signs and symbols of that to the world around us. We don't bring in the kingdom of God. We don't save the earth we don't fix all the environmental problems, but in our lives, in our activism, in all that we do are meant to embody the life of the kingdom of God, which looks forward to the new creation, the renewal of all things. And so when we think about the practical implications of this, I could talk for a long time and I have five minutes, so you can ask me questions tomorrow, I'll leave questions at the end of my workshop tomorrow. I just want to suggest a couple of things, and these are really general things, and these are orientated in the first instance at those of you who are pastors or who are planning to be pastors. And if you are a pastor, you know this. If you aren't, you'll discover this. You're going to be pestered to take on a hundred different causes and a hundred different things. And you're always going to have too much to do already, as it is. What is a pastor called to do? Well, first and foremost, a pastor is called to preach the word of God, to administer communion and baptism, and to fit, care for her people. That's what a pastor does. And that's what you should do. That's what I would say you should do. It's often going to be lay people, perhaps, that are going to have to take the lead. 
in starting organizations, in joining organizations, joining the good work that's already going on, in, in changing people's habits and lifestyles and embodying different ways of living in community. But you know what? They're not going to do it if they don't see their pastors, if they don't see Christian leaders proclaiming the whole word of God. So it begins actually by simply returning to the biblical gospel, putting the creation back into new creation, and in teaching and preaching, helping people see God's cosmic purposes for the whole of the earth, for the whole of creation, and how the state of our world now challenges Christians especially to respond to that. Helping them when we serve communion, to see we celebrate in communion the God who has bound himself to creation in the person of Jesus Christ. So that, as Dr. Walton reminded us earlier, there is no unsacred spaces on earth. As Wendell Berry says, there are only sacred places and desecrated places. To see the world as holy, though we knew it not. To enter into the joy of life in this world that God has bound God's self to in Christ. To remind people that even as we serve communion, um, as we preach the word of God. And also, of course, to embody that in our own lives. To live the lives of virtue in all respects, including our relationship with other creatures, with the earth, with other people, and our care for the poor, that show what that might look like. So putting ourselves back into creation. And I think the place where that begins is actually being attentive to it. In our age of distraction, where it is so easy to be a nerd to the world around us, we need to reclaim a vision of the Sabbath that is entering into God's rule. That means it doesn't all depend upon us, that enables us to be attentive to the world around us, to who we are, to the people we love, and to the places we love. I think pastors, Christian leaders, absolutely must find a way to set aside the technology that distracts us from all of this. I think it's actually one of the essential practices that is going to enable us to respond rightly and biblically and faithfully to the environmental crises that we've talked about. There's much else that I could say about the practice of that. Um, And I've unpacked this a bit in my book about thinking using this acronym of AWAKE, of ways that we can do this, but I will leave that for questions uh, later on. And just suggest the challenge to respond to this faithfully and biblically, but also the invitation. Much of this is a return, I think, to traditional Christian virtue that we have lost. And much of this can seem like a burden, like a thing to add. But you know, I always think about the Apostle Paul, who had this one crystal clear mission to preach the gospel, the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet Paul is reminded to care for the poor. And Paul tells us, He didn't designate that to someone else and say, no, I can't be bothered with that. No, for him, it was actually woven in intimately with the gospel itself. So he said, this was the very thing I was eager to do. And his letters are full of raising money, right, to help those.